this is the session we've got for you today. There is the information about the session, the highlights of it, for you to have a quick look. But Richard, there's nothing about Richard on this screen, is there? But there's lots to say about him. And I'm just going to leave you with a slide for a minute or so to look through about Richard, our great speaker for this evening. So here is a little bit about Richard. Have a look through. You'll see some surprising facts and interesting info. And then in just a minute, I'll hand over to our great speaker for this evening, Richard Hollis. So let's have a countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Richard, over to you. Okay, everybody with me? Yep. Thank you. Dal, I'm sorry, I was falling asleep in your introduction of me. That was that was the most boring introduction I've read of me. I, I should apologize. Oh. No, my, my, my mother wrote that bio of me, so I, sh I, I should have preferenced that. Anyway, never let a speaker write his own bio. Uh, good evening, everybody. I think this is the, I haven't spoken to BCS in, in, in quite some time. And uh, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks for the kind words, uh, Dallum. You probably want to hold those off until I finished uh, this. And uh, maybe you, wanted, you should have hold a, held a couple back. I'm a little nervous about presenting this. A, it's the first time. And, and B, I'm just, it's, I'm not sure how you'll take the material, I, I actually. Um, it, by way of introduction, let me first say I'm, I'm, uh, I've been doing this, uh, you can see by my, by my introduction, I've been doing this for almost 30 years. In some way, shape or form, I've called myself a cybersecurity risk professional for 30 years. And, and, and full disclosure, those of you who do know me and or have seen me before, you can clearly see I'm getting old. And that, that bothers me every time I see myself in the camera. But uh, I'm getting old. And I have to admit that recently I've been told by people I trust, people I trust, that I might be getting somewhat grumpy with my uh, advancing years. So uh, fair enough. Uh, but like I said, I've, I've called myself a cyber risk professional. People have called me other things, but uh, we, that's, this is not the format for that. And, and it, as I'm getting older and, 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 and getting to my twilight years in my profession, I'm starting to take a look at uh, an honest look at my industry. And, and honestly, I, I, I don't really like what I see. I don't like where we've been. I don't like where we are. And I certainly don't like where I think we're going. And I've reached recently in the last couple of years, I've reached a conclusion that the industry, by the way, it's, it is, is not designed to be successful. I've, I've, I've come to believe that my industry has failed and will continue to fail due to some inherent structural, uh, st structural designs in the way that we're at, at, that the industry comes together. Okay, and, and it's there, I, I want, I think it's there for everybody to see. If you look, and I mean, look objective, the, the evidence is, is clearly visible and it almost seems overwhelmingly obvious. And it certainly is repetitive. Um, and I'd like to present what I think is that evidence to you tonight, uh, call it constructive criticism or just call it the complaints of a, of a cranky old man. But uh, all I ask is you keep an open mind. Uh, we're gonna try to make room for some questions, uh, but I, I, I don't mean to, well, Let's start here because you know while I say keep an open mind, my lawyers have clearly said uh, you know before you before you get into this, uh, have everybody make sure they read and agree to this. So if everybody can take a minute, uh, uh, read through this disclaimer. Uh, let me know when you're done. I'll go ahead and, and we can move into what's wrong with our security industry. I'm kidding tell you what, in the interest of time, why don't we just trust one another? Take my word that these views, these views are personal. In exchange, I'll take your word for it that you won't take any legal action against me or hire somebody to break my legs with a cricket bat, okay? Um, let's go. Let's, um, let's, let's start at the beginning. If for, for me, take, a, take an inventory, our track record. It's been over three decades now since the, the first computer virus was reported. Back in 1986, boy, was I a young and good looking guy then. Uh, so 30 years I've been, I, I, as, as, as introducing this, I said, I've been doing this for 30 years now. You'd think after 30 years, we'd have a track record. But I look and say, all right, 30 years of, uh, of, us, uh, of us trying to make a, a dent in this industry. And just two years ago, I don't know if you've noticed, but 
back in 2019, the World Economic Forum added cyber attacks, data fraud, information theft to their top 10 list of, of, of terms that they considered most likely to occur, most impactful should they occur, and of course, most concerning for all businesses globally. And when I think about that, I think, well, I've had 30 years, 35 years of practice. And now when you look about the three out of the top 10 risks facing businesses around the world, that's 30% of the top 10 global risks that are facing businesses today are attributed to our industry, the cybersecurity industry. The risk that I have been, uh, that I, don't, I don't know if you have been professionally responsible for addressing, but you know, if you agree that our industry was founded on the basic idea of preventing business systems from attacks, breaches, and theft, surely we failed. We have, and, and don't call me Shirley. That's from airplane, I'm sorry. That's programmed in my head, I automatically. So I, we, we failed, it, it's, it's, it's there. It, for, for me, the, the, the clearest sign of failure in the last three to five years has been the onset, uh, well, let's say 10 years, the onset of regulation and legislation. For me, when the government steps in and gets involved, you know it's over. And you know it's because the industry itself has failed. So the rise of DPA and GDPR and PCI and all these outside pieces of legislation and regulation for me are also signs of the industry failing to police itself. And for me, this is very much like, like safety in the energy or automotive and airline industries. Remember, remember buying a car back in the 1970s? These things were death traps. You get into an accident driving 30 miles an hour and you fly through the windshield because no seat belts, no airbags, no shatterproof windshields, no anti-lock brakes, no crash safety testing. Thousands of people would die every year needlessly in minor accidents till the government had to step in and start regulating safety mandating things like seat belts. To me, that's, yeah, any, anyway, the, the, the new onslaught of, of, of prominence, I should say, of regulation in our industry is another sign that we as professionals have, fail, have failed in our industry. And Shirley, don't call me Shirley, look at these numbers. I mean, this is just, the next one is the, the actual statistics. These numbers are staggering. These, and I don't, I don't, I don't like, just like any other professional in my field, I don't, I don't like uh, to look at statistics. Um, but look at these. I mean, these, these are from global data breach uh, reports. Look at these numbers. We're losing over 18 million records a day. And look at the size of the breaches. I mean, Yahoo, 1.5 billion records. Facebook, 533 million records, Marriott, 400 million, LinkedIn, 165 million, eBay, 150 million. The numbers are staggering and clearly indicate we're losing. Look at this number. We've, this, is, this is from the Global Breach Level um, Index. Uh, this is a, an amalgamation of everybody who's under mandatory disclosure who reports missing records. All right, look at this. We've lost over 14 billion records just in the last seven years alone. Think about that. That's more than twice the number of people walking on the face of this planet. We've lost those records twice over. And this is just a number reported by countries with mandatory disclosure. So you know it's, it's only a fraction of what we've actually lost. Whether you believe it or not, at a minimum, we've lost 14 billion records. Clearly, we've, we're, we're, we're failing. These breaches and the regulation, are, are for me, are the surest signs that we're not getting the job done. We're failing. The cybersecurity industry is failing. But why? I, where, where are the faults? What's the root causes for our failure? How do we fix them? What lessons do we learn? This is, these are the questions that, that make me so grumpy. And I want to show you what makes me grumpy and want to show you what I think are five obvious and what, what I've called for, for a sexy title, epic failures. Let's start, let's start right at the beginning. Let's start with the obvious. First and foremost, I want to say that our security product vendors have failed us. Why? Because their products don't work. Their products don't work. There, I've, I've said it, they don't work. They do not meet the challenges presented by our adversaries. They never have, that's a fact. They are and have, and have always been reactive, not proactive. Our security product vendors have failed to keep pace with the skills, the, the, the ingenuity, the adaptability of the threat actors. They're a step behind the threats. You see that, don't you? Our products are a step behind the threats when clearly their job should be to be a step ahead. They failed to do this. 
the threat actors have set the pace of this game that we play. The threat actors set the pace of my day, what I do eight hours a day. And I can't keep up and you can't keep up, we can't keep up. Our vendors, for me, our vendors are selling us knives to take the gunfights, if that makes sense. We're, we're ill-equipped. On top of it, we're continually finding now back doors and inherent design deficiency in the products, in their products, which we buy from them to put on our systems, which give us more vulnerabilities. But that's not something we hear from them. What we hear from them is, is, is the hype, okay? I know every industry does it, but ours has a knack of uh, obfuscation. The marketing messages of our vendors border on mysticism. Look at these five taglines. I just pulled these down to, for this presentation. Market leading the GAV and in integrated threat intelligence and immediate response. What, you know, it slices, it dices, it's wait, what's in the GAV? I had to look that up and this is what I do. This next generation antivirus, by the way. Uh, first cloud native endpoint protection platform, and that makes my business more secure. How? Auton I love this one. Autonomous AI endpoint protection. Okay, it's smart. It's sexy. It plays by its own rules. <laughs> Is that even a good idea? Detect and protect against known and unknown vulnerabilities with cross-generational protection techniques. Cross-generational. If I even understood that, that's like a grandfather and a grandson, that's cross-generational to me. You mean something we used 20 years ago plus something we're using today, that's gonna to be more effective? How can cross-generational protection techniques, whatever those are, possibly improve my security? My, okay, I could go on about the hype, we all go on about the hype, every industry does it. My problem's not the hype, my problem really is with the way that they sell it, okay? These products are sold to us through hype and fear, FUD. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That's what our team jerseys say in this industry. Be afraid, be very afraid. Yeah, fear, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, Wizard of Oz. This fear, this fear that they, that they use, here's the hype, here's the fear. The fear plays on your emotions, our emotions, my emotions. It clouds our judgment. This is the purpose of using FUD. It's a classic wartime propaganda strategy and, it, and our industry trades in it. You know it, I know it. How many times have you heard, you know, it's not a question of uh, if, it's a question of when. That's FUD. How many times have you heard that? The more FUD is repeated, the more it enters in the collective unconsciousness and the greater its effect can be. Tell me about, it. I'm an American, we, we're weapons of mass destruction. You know, that's FUD. Even the term cyber war echoes these messages of traditional warfare, us versus them. Us versus them, be afraid, be very afraid, but, and we are, we, we drink the proverbial Kool-Aid and buy the products that will secure us from them. We, we go even farther and base our whole strategies on this fear and not what's actually good for our businesses. Vendor FUD only serves one purpose and that's to cloud your judgment, to get you to buy the product. And here's what you we should I, I, here's what I think we should openly acknowledge, start to acknowledge to really understand the role that vendors play in our industry today. We look to vendors to solve our security problems, but we fail to recognize that frankly, it's not in their economic best interest to do so. It's a fact. Computer security vendors profit from the insecurity of computing. We don't why don't we acknowledge that? It's not a paranoid, grumpy old man. That's just a fact. It's a lot like the pharmaceutical industry profits from treating sickness and colds and flus and diseases, viruses and infections. We're an industry wherein its vendors find more profit from treating the symptoms than finding a cure. Treat the viruses and infection. That's where the money is. Look at these stats. It's a fact after every major breach was followed by a profit or share increase for the leaders in the industry. I gotta ask myself, how is it that they profit from breaches and not by preventing breaches? The answer, because we see breaches and we freak out and we buy more of their kit. The kit doesn't work, so there's more breaches. We freak out again and buy more of the kit. It's a revenue cycle, it perpetuates itself. Why would, why would they stop if they profit from it? Also, there's, they, they are, they, are they held accountable for breaches associated with their products? It's a rhetorical question. Have you read an SLA for any of your vendors? 
Absolutely not. Absolutely no accountability. So we, our security vendors give us overhyped products that are ineffective. They sell it to us through fear, uncertainty, and doubt. They profit from the insecurity. That's a fact. And they bear absolutely no accountability. These are the facts as I see them in the industry. Did I say I was grumpy? Okay, now I want to talk about leadership, right? Take a look at this list. Aren't these the product leaders in our industry? We go to these guys, we, we go to them to buy treatments for the viruses and infections that, that, that make us sick, right? These are the guys that talk the talk. These are the guys, the, the leaders in our industry. But did you know that everyone on this list has been hacked in the last 18 months? RSA, FireEye, F-Secure, Threat Connect, Kaspersky, VeriSign, all these guys have been hacked. You know that? It's a who's who in the security vendor industry. And of course, many, 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 many others. But these are the big guys. These are the leaders, the trusted names, the big boys we look to for leadership. They talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. We buy products from these guys to solve our problems when in fact, they're struggling to solve the same problems we are. They're not shepherds, they're sheep. They're as lost as we are. RSA gets hacked and loses their code. Why? Because they can't secure their systems. It's taken right from their systems. We bought that encryption product. Now it's useless. So we go back and we buy another. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Animal House. I knew I'd come up with that one. <laughs> Okay, anyway, it's, um, take a, take a you, you've seen this, just the, let me just give you one example. Just a couple of months ago, SonicWall's secure, uh, secure remote access solution product line, the whole product line got hacked. On the, bottom of this, uh, on the bottom of the screen here, you're looking at, this is the actual press release in which they blamed it on a zero day vulnerability. And with the help of top threat researchers and a forensics team, Okay, read, they outsource it to a third party. They released a patch with the code, now hardened. Okay, okay, well, we're all good. Code's been hardened, all good, no harm done. Wait a minute, what's a zero day vulnerability again? That's an unknown unknown, right? Yeah, so can you explain to me how a vendor would have an unknown anything in their product, in the product that they built, in the product that they manufactured, how is it that a vendor can manufacture a product with a back door in it and not know it? It's like, it's like, it's like buying a house from a, a professional builder and, and one day you come home and everything you own is gone. You've been robbed. Then you find out there, you know, that they got in through a, a, a secret door and you go to the builder and, and he says, oh, geez, I didn't know about that. I didn't know about that secret door and I built you that house. I built you that, you know, I didn't know that back door was in the house that I, saw, I built and I sold to you. Anyway, and this is the funny bit, turns out that the hack also included a $5 million US dollar ransomware attack. And you know what? They paid it. You know why? That's what sheep do. Okay, clearly, I think, clearly we looked, we're not finding leadership from the leaders that we, we are turned to. One more thing before we, 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 we move on. I don't, I don't know if you've seen this, but um, this keeps me awake at night. It comes from a Wired Magazine article printed over two years ago, back in 2019, okay? Have you seen this? Have you noticed this? It's how the Chinese are quietly been buying up security companies. 32 of the top 100 VPN vendors are now Chinese owned. What's going on here? Last year alone, 17 of the Gartner top 100 cybersecurity companies are Chinese. Now, given, the, given the, the predominant role of nation states on the threat landscape, do you know who owns your product vendor? Do you care? Should you care? So what do we take away from these? What are the lessons we need to learn? Uh, to fix this industry. This is again from a grumpy old man, but uh, first and foremost, we got to start saying this out loud. Vendor technology is not effective as it needs to be. All right, the first step to, 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 to fixing a problem is admitting you have one. Why don't we talk about this more? All right, our products are not fit for purpose. They do not work. They are simply not up to meeting the challenges of the threat landscape. That's a fact. 
why is that acceptable to us? They're not just ineffective now. We're also finding with RSA and solar winds and sonic wall and all that, clearly showing us that they're insecure by design. And they're introducing, in fact, more risks by with these technical vulnerabilities that are built baked into their product, like any other product. And they're making product, product uh, the problem worse. Vendor products don't work. Whose fault is this? It's our fault. Clearly, it's our fault. It's our fault. We don't define or apply a common definition for product effectiveness in our industry. We don't define quality criteria for products. We let the vendors define this for us. We let them tell us what we should understand and accept as a quality performance. The example I love is when you buy in any kind of monitoring, a SIM, an IDS, an IPS, and they give you, well, here's the acceptable false positives, false negative ratios. Really? Really? Acceptable false positive. Now, first of all, that's an oxymoron wrapped in some heavy irony, huh? <laughs> but this is the vendor telling you that the product's gonna disappoint you X percent of the time. What? How about 0% of the time? Take a, take a look at this. I, I, I really like this. Um, we need to stop, my point is we need to stop accepting a vendor's definition of what's effective and start agreeing and applying a common criteria for efficacy across the industry. Here's a model that just asks four separate questions. This comes from some really good research uh, by uh, entitled Cybersecurity Technology Efficacy Report. It was published last October by a guy named Joseph Hubbock. It's brilliant. It's brilliant in its simplicity. It just applies four criteria. A, is it, is it fit for purpose? Does it do what it says it does? You know, second, is it, is it fit for use? Can we use it easily? All right, or do I need to go to MIT for six years and, and, and get a doctorate to, to be able to, uh, to, to run it? Is it built for purpose, meaning is it secure by design? And of course, where does it come from? These, just these simple four criteria change everything. If you bought a product based on these four criteria, it's, it's, if we don't, we're always going to end up letting a vendor define quality for us. And, you know, that's like my mother asking me if I was a good boy today. I, you know, the answer is always yes. All right, anyway, next lesson, lesson three. We need to stop drinking the proverbial Kool-Aid, like I said, all right? Stop accepting the lies, all right? He, he, we need to stop accepting the fear, uncertainty, the doubt. It's clouding our judgment. All right, the perception of risk seen through the lens of fear inhib inhibits our ability to make good decisions. Well, that should be common sense, but it's not. All right, our product purchases are now, dry, you know, should be driven by quality criteria, not fear. And of course, our strategy. You know, we, you know, above all, we need to remember the game plan. What's, you know, and the game plan is, 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 is fairly simple. If you remember, we all got together and we agreed, remember the strategy is, is uh, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna protect people, process, and technology. It's a threefold strategy, right? But vendor FUD steers all of our attention toward protecting technology, 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 and it knocks us off balance. You know, it completely upsets our, our, our whole strategy. So we overinvest in, a, you know, in, we invest 100% of our budget and one third of our strategy. And we neglect our people, we neglect our processes. 100% of the budget goes to product. Do you know, let me, do you know a business that spends as much on employee security awareness training as they do on security hardware? Do you know a business that spends as much as uh, time on incident response, business continuity, disaster recovery, you know, as they do on security software? Next, until we have vendor accountability, we will never have security by design. I, we, you know, so you, uh, 10 years ago, we were still optimistic that we are promoting security by design. And now we're finding that in fact, one of the worst violators of security by design are our security product vendors. But this should be crystal clear. It should be very clear. And I'm not sure how we've continued to allow this for the past 30 years, but we have. Finally, until vendors are incentivized to produce more effective products, nothing's gonna change. 
right? Until then, we'll keep, they'll keep selling us the treatments for the symptoms because that's where the money is. We'll never find a cure when there's so much money to be made in treating the symptoms. Okay. So you see how that grumpy thing sticks with me now, huh? You see why people are talking about me behind my back. I even, even right in front of me, to be honest with you. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next failure. Internet service providers, ISPs have failed us. Well, how have they failed us, Rich? Oh, call me crazy, but in my mind, and I hope in everybody's mind, ISPs provide the gateways that we all use to access the internet. And as such, there's a huge opportunity that we're missing. They are in a unique position of access control. All right, they open the door to this crazy nightclub that we call the internet. You pay them their monthly cover charge and bang, you're in. Here's your bandwidth, no questions asked. But this is, this is a rough club this, you know, inside this club. You can bring any weapons into this club. You know, inside there are no rules, no laws, no policing, no right, no wrong, no consequences for any bad behavior. It's a tough place. But maybe because it's a tough place, Maybe it's a tough place because these guys let anybody in. That's the way I'm, that's the conclusion I'm coming to. Why aren't they acting as a bouncer to this nightclub, denying access to clearly bad elements and throwing out anybody inside who's acting as a threat to the rest of us? Call me grumpy, but I think ISPs have failed us, all right? I'm not, I don't advocate uh, regulating ISPs, but come on. How about a little common sense? Think about it. Why don't they provide or enforce any security controls at all to access? How easy would it be for these guys to start black, blocking bad sites, stopping IP spoofing or denial of service attacks? Why don't they run? Yeah, if you think about it, how easy it would be to just run all the traffic through a sewage treatment, uh, uh, some sewage treatment and clean out all the malware. They don't identify or report cyber crime and they don't prosecute unless of course, you know, you hack, try to take out their services. My point is this, think how differently the internet could be if suddenly ISPs did just a little house cleaning. Any one of these things, but they don't. Why? Why don't they stop the botnets or the denial of services that fly across their network that they see, you know they see it. They carry that traffic. The answer, cash. That's where the money is. That's where the money is, all right? because they sell bandwidth. They sell the bandwidth that carries the botnets. They sell the bandwidth that delivers the denial of service, that the denial of service attacks consume. They sell the bandwidth that delivers the malware and the phishing attacks to the front doors of our homes and our businesses. Security is not their revenue stream, bandwidth is their revenue stream at the expense of security. And of course, why are they gonna stop when there is absolutely, they're not held accountable for any breaches associated with their service. Not so much, no, 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 they're not. Leadership, sure, we could talk about leadership. Here's a list of the leading ISPs, and you know where this is going. Every single one of them also hacked last 18 months. You see any irony here? I do. What can we learn? Well, clearly ISPs don't protect us from the internet or the internet from us, and that's, that's an, that's a, that's escaping a bullet. You know, either side of the coin, they get off scot free. My question to you is, why aren't we upset about this? Why isn't this the absolute minimum that you'd expect from them? Would it be unreasonable to expect this? Where's the duty of care? Where's the best efforts? Where's the oh, I don't know minimum effort? until ISPs are held accountable, we're, we're gonna continue to receive cyber attacks. Again, without any accountability, why would we expect anything to change on the internet threat landscape? Anytime soon, or anytime at all for that matter. I think this is a lesson that we should come to grips with and say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah without accountability, okay. Another lesson, until ISPs are incentivized to provide more secure services, nothing will. And of course, if there's, and this is my point, if there's no money in it for them, why would they? Which brings us to, you know, oh, I don't know, this, this really puzzles me because when I think about it from a consumer point of view, uh, you know, as, as I understand the ISP market, they're struggling for billable revenue. And I don't see how they don't see this and just, you know, uh, 
doing some, as I said, house cleaning services and making it cost plus. I don't, I don't see how they don't see a market for that, but they don't. Failure number three, managed security service providers. I have a hard time with that term. MSSPs, they've also failed us, but I think they failed us in a much different way than our vendors. Our vendors sell us products, right? MSSPs technically are selling us a process. They're product centric, but they're a process nonetheless. But these processes are failed us. Why? It's their processes, not our business processes. For purposes of this, this uh, for purposes of this presentation, let's just categorize these guys as selling us security monitoring and reporting services. Right? It's the solutions that we buy uh, to make a sound if a tree falls in the woods. All right, so we can react. But let's face it, you know, their their services are scoped to their monitoring products capabilities and lack of them and their limitations, and not to our actual business processes. Clearly, you know, they deliver something that's easily packageable. That means that, you know, your little, any, anything that deviates from what they can package is gonna be out of scope. And you clearly see that with any kind of monitoring of software as a service or any other non-traditional platforms, they're already out of scope of any monitoring. Why and who, who doesn't use any kind of software as a service these days to process our information assets? But the bigger failure is that these services are extremely unclear when they're defining maintenance and management responsibilities and only seem to deliver alerts, right? Remember the false positives? That's, there's that cunning marketing guy who earned his money that day, false positives, false. <laughs> I don't know, I call them false alerts, all right? The alerts that are, are wrong. They, and anyway, these products, my biggest problem is these products just they produce a barrage of alerts with no context whatsoever, which leads to a, an industry problem. You know, it, currently we're talking about the industry recognizes that 40% of all SIM alerts are false positives. 40%. Now I get that an algorithm required to differentiate between false positives and true positives. It's difficult to develop, but come on. You know, when you're wrong 40% of the time, maybe you're not ready for the market. What happens is exactly what you think happens. You know, all these false positives, false positives, false positives, we start to just, it's alert fatigue. It's, it's clearly the best analogy is, is a, you know, and understandably so. These products are like smoke detectors to me with weak batteries. Beep, 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 beep. And the onus is on you to get up off the couch, go investigate, assess, resolve, and, and turn off the alarm. It's a game. It's a game that every single one, one of us who have bought a, a managed security service provider service has, has played that game. And we all know it's, 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 you know, we go around again. We buy this cool technology, but the MSP doesn't install or configure it correctly. Where our staff aren't trained to, uh, to, to, uh, to implement it and, and do the maintenance. Uh, uh, you know, it just creates alerts, 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 doesn't do any remediation. We buy that cool thing and, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, remember that guy who down in IT, the guy who always smelled like onions, he knew it. He was the guy who wanted to buy it. He knew how to do, oh, he left months ago. Anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't fix anything. It just keeps beeping. So you pull the plug and now you know what you call it? You call it shelfware. A, a year later, somebody else comes along with a, with a, a bright, shiny object that, you know, it's cool, catches their eye and you go around again. And it's good. It's good for them. They make a lot of money. It's bad for you. You just you just keep playing the same game, and you go around in circles. And you know what? Are they are any MSSPs accountable for any breaches associated with their service? Seeing a pattern here. I'm sorry. I heard leadership. Yeah, yeah. Once again, here's here's you know the leaders in the industry. Last 18 months, all the same. All of these guys have been hit in the last 18 months and they sell security monitoring services for a living. I don't get it. The Solar Winds firearm breach last year was a game changer. And yes, I hate people who use the term game changer. Irony, no thanks. I've got plenty. What are the important lessons here? Well, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. My grandfather used to say that and gosh, Bless, God bless his wisdom. Every MS, uh, MSSP provider believe that it's their process, not yours, all right? 
rather than the opposite. It should be your business processes that these these products, uh, it's, it's square peg, uh, uh, square hole. But when products don't or won't or can't integrate, they end up just creating holes that they are actually meant to spot. And those holes become another problem for us. Solutions we buy become problems. Alerts alone do not security make. We don't need alerts. We need someone to put out the fire. Put out the fire, chiefy. Jaws. Put out the fire, chief. Put out the fire, chief. That's from Jaws. It's a great line. We need investigation. We need prioritization. We need remediation. If you don't have the, and, we, and who's got the resources? If you don't have the resources to do the investigation, to you know, prioritize and do the remediation, who does have the resources? Now you've got just another problem. Just another problem. Until MSSPs, and of course, are, they're held accountable for breaches associated with the services, nothing's going to change. Do you know of any MSSP who will take liability for the integrity of their alerts? To me, we're just paying for these expensive smoke detectors from vendors that bear absolutely no responsibility when the house burns down. Cause of fire? Mm, gee, I don't know. I didn't see that coming. And without accountability, what's, what's the, where's the value? Where is the value in this? Lesson four, until MSSPs are incentivized to produce, provide better services, nothing will ever change. Of course, why would they change your business model if there's no money into it? Okay, failure number four, businesses. This is the obvious one, right? Businesses have failed without question in the cybersecurity industry, all right? In many, 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 many areas. And there's webinars and presentations for each one of those areas. I just wanna focus on three. And I wanna focus on these three because we've had 30 years and we still can't get three little things right. All right, these, these are the basics. We've had 30 years to figure out things like, what's the cost benefit? You know, what's the return on investment for security spend? What's the annual loss expectancy? The ALE, the ROI, we've had 30 years, we still cannot figure it out. We're 30 years down the road and businesses have still failed to realize the cost benefits associated with cybersecurity, articulate them, All right? We failed to integrate cybersecurity into our business model. I don't know why we did it. Remember the days before, uh, you know, wheelchair access and fire life safety, how quickly everybody suddenly had a, you know, wheelchair accessible ramp and fire alarms that integrated fairly quickly, but cyber, not so much. No, we did it with fire life safety. We know it can be done, but we can't seem to crack the code, the mysterious code for ROI and ALE and figure out you know, how much cyber risk and, and make it a boardroom topic. And so what do we do? We mistake compliance with risk management. We're compliant to PCI, to GDPR, and that's our risk management. Still, after all these years, we still fail to align, you know, to, to, we've got this people, process, and technology strategy, but we fail to align the resources in the business to our threefold strategy. We mistakenly implement product for strategy, like I said, but we continue to neglect the other two thirds of the, of the strategy, the people in the process. We don't, this is because we don't understand the ROI associated with people and process. As a result, cybersecurity gets delegated to the IT department with all the IT department's strengths, weaknesses, politics, budget, resources, lack of resources. It becomes an IT thing. Man, who doesn't outsource their IT day nowadays? We've had 30 years to get this right, and we still haven't. And, but for me, on a professional level, the probably the most upsetting is the third one, is this, this idea of a duty of care. This is, this is the most disappointing for me, that our businesses have failed to recognize, you know what, it's your moral obligation to safeguard the sensitivity of the data entrusted to you by your clients. When all said and done, it's just the right thing to do. It's what they expect of us. It's what they expect of you and your business. It's the right thing. I, and we, we just haven't seen it. I, I, I've really, I, I, I seldom meet an, a CEO who gets it, who understands that, that, that this, is, this, is, this is sensitive data. Okay, so lesson, obviously, 
first, you, you, you would have thought we learned, would have learned this little simple reality a long time ago. Businesses don't embrace anything without tangible ROI, nor should they. What's the return on, I spend X, I wanna get Y, okay. And until we crack it for cybersecurity, it's never going to be, the business will never recognize it. If you can't measure the return, there is no return. And yet we continue to fail in, in making business cases for cybersecurity. Still, 30 years down the road. Cybersecurity is a process, it's not a product. I thought we all agreed on that. I sure, that was been my understanding for the last 30 years. Until this is understood, it's always gonna be an IT thing. You know, we, we, we say that, that the only effective strategy is the one that addresses people, process, technology. And then we run out to buy products and complain that the, the business sees security as an IT thing. Okay, lesson number three. This is, not protect, this is not about protecting ones and zeros. This is data about people's lives. Why don't we get that? You know, we talk about, you know, 14 plus billion people, who, uh, records we have already lost. Don't you think every single one of them expected us to protect that data and we let them down? I let them down, you let them down if you work in this industry. I believe that businesses have failed to understand that this is data about somebody's mother, somebody's father, their sister, their brother, their, their nan, their children, all right? People are stealing their data and their privacy has been violated and their lives have been impacted and we've let them down. All right, is it bringing you down enough? Let's, let's sum up where we are. Let's, where are we right now? You know, I always thought it helpful to put it, this is my helpful little, uh, before we cover the last failure, I just wanted to show you this, what I consider a helpful Venn diagram to visually summarize the design of our industry and maybe maybe you can spot the disconnects. This is, this is my joke slide, by the way. Yeah. All right. Okay, let me address the, the last and what I think is the most important failure of our industry. You, me, us, we failed, I think. I, yeah, all the fingers I've pointed, first four fingers I've pointed, but this is the most, this to me is where I, where I end up, all right? In fact, I'd go so far to say that, that you and I are the underlying, underlying cause for all the failures in our industry. Why? Well, simple, it's you believed what you were told. I believed what I was told. I didn't demand value for money, you didn't demand, we didn't demand any value for our money. We didn't expect more. We didn't ask for more. We didn't hold anybody accountable for anything. And, you, and we certainly didn't apply the same standard for excellence that we demand in all other areas of our life to our industry. Why is that? I got a brother that I refuse to have dinner with because uh, you know we go out to a restaurant and he'll, he'll send back the water. It's got too much ice, it's got too little ice. This is cold, this is too hot, this is too cold, this is, this is not what I ordered. And he's a pain in the ass because his, he, he expects, his expectation for excellence when we go out just, just makes him the worst person to dine with, okay? And yet he's also got an e-commerce business. And yet he's got, he's got, you know, he buys antivirus that doesn't work. He's always complaining to me and coming to me for free advice. And it's, I, I just find it odd that we don't hold our vendors in our own industry to a standard of excellence that we apply to, you know, when we go get a sandwich and some crisp down at the, you know, at, at the local uh, restaurant. I don't, I just don't see the disconnect. You know that currently there's over 4,000 enterprise level cybersecurity products to choose from on the market. Thousands of managed service providers and ISPs out there to choose from. All of these vendors and service providers are vying for your dollar, your pound, your euro, your yen. Can you imagine the change that you and I can affect in our industry if as consumers of these products and services tomorrow, we just started expecting a little more? And then you know what, the next week, we started demanding a little more. I wanna leave you with one final lesson. And I think this is the most important lesson for me that I meet other cybersecurity professionals in my industry. And if they share my concerns, I say, you know, uh, be the change you wish to see in the industry. Do not, do not think that you cannot make a difference. 
if you're as unhappy as I am, the change you want to see starts with you. Exercise your power as a consumer. Expect more, demand more, and maybe, just maybe, you'll get it. Okay, anyway, till then, anybody says, why is that rich guy so grumpy? Or if you just want to understand and explain the reason our security industry has failed, I put together this nifty equation, all right? Ineffective products and solutions, plus no definition, no definition, common definition of what is effective. No accountability, no economic incentives for any change. All of this is, for me, we're designed to fail. Okay. That was probably a lot longer and a little more preachier than you expected, but um, I appreciate the time uh, and I appreciate your sense of humor. I would, I would, if you're interested in learning more, this is probably the best place to start. Um, this is this uh, piece of, I think it's 50, 60 pages. It's a survey that, that was done by a lot of CISOs. It's put together this uh, cybersecurity technology efficacy report about how we don't apply common, common criteria to products and, and services for what's, what, what, what should be the, the minimum. Certainly for me, it was one of the standout things I've seen in our industry done in a long time, uh, published. Uh, anyway, it's just, you could just Google it. It's a great place to start. Um, and I'd probably leave it with, we'll leave it with this. Remember, Remember our, our, our agreement, right? No legal action, no, you see me on the street, no leg breaking, I'd appreciate it. Uh, we do have time for questions. Uh, I don't know if you like the answers or, or I, uh, I don't know if you found this helpful. I hope so. Again, I apologize if, uh, if, if, you're, a, <laughs> if you're a vendor. I apologize if you're a service provider. Um, it wasn't meant. Uh, to be anything other than constructive criticism. But anyway, thanks for your time. Uh, I figure out, uh, I've got, uh, if you've got some questions and you drop them in the, uh, I think I can do this, uh, with a little help from my friends. So there's questions on the Q&A button and we've got some questions in the chat as well. I think if you move the mouse to the top, you can see the Q&A yep. button. Yep, got it. Okay, I've got a question. I'll just I'll just wing it here. I've got a question. Uh, how do you sustainably measure the risk associated with the vendor? I always well, the SLA is the first place to start. I'll just uh, I'll just uh, wing this here. Uh, the SLA, uh, any SLA with a vendor, you know, I look to any vendor. I buy products. I recommend products. I have to. This is this is this is the world I work in. Uh, but what I measure a vendor from measure get vendor against is the clarity, the honesty, the transparency, the accountability found in his service level agreement. Um, when's the last time you asked a vendor if they're liable for a breach? And if they're giving you a frontline product, why, why wouldn't that question be on the table? Not that you get the answer you want, but it's the, it's the, it's the resp it's how that response comes back to you that would help me measure how much risk is associated with the vendor. Certainly now we're seeing, I, I, I wanted to pointedly bring out, security products are popping up all over with, with zero day vulnerabilities and backdoors in them. That's not a good sign, all right? We've, you know, when a security vendor is, is manufacturing a security product that you and I are putting on a perimeter and, dis, and, and counting on, for me, I, I, I'm hoping very soon in our industry, we start to get accountability for, for security by design. If that code isn't the best code it can possibly be, if it doesn't meet or exceed OWASP, I, I don't understand how we're not getting liability from a vendor. So these issues, these are absolutely issues that I bring up to a vendor. I, 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 honestly, I don't get the responses, but I think if we all started doing it more, um, uh, and, and any product you ever buy should go on a risk register, first of all. It should go on a risk register. And subject to pen testing and anything you find, I, I, I meet a client, that's one of the first things I do is, how, where, where are your products? Why aren't your products on a, a known known in terms of the risks? Missing, from missing patches to zero day vulnerabilities. I've um, got a, a question here from Stuart or a comment to security products make the systems more complex and complexity is the enemy of security. Better to have secure system rather than have an insecure system with layers of prevention software on the top. This would seem obvious, but nobody's doing this. Why? <laughs> okay, Stuart, <laughs> I think the answer was in the, yeah, so I don't know why, Stuart. I, I don't, I, I am absolutely Stuart. I would agree with that less is more. Uh, and products seem to, you know, I, I again, Nobody's doing this. I, I believe it's because we're, 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 
We're reacting to these messages of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And we're told, we're told everything from, you know, certainly, you know, layered security is great. By the way, you know, think of it, layered security is great if you're a vendor, you know, put an IDS on each, you know, segment of the network. Uh, you know, okay, so that's four IDSs you want, Mr. Hollis. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, Layered security is often is often a sign of how miserable our product our vendors have let us down, isn't it? Anyway, sorry, Stuart, I'm not answering your question, and it's because I don't know why. It, it, it would seem obvious. It is obvious to me, uh, but nobody's doing it. I don't know why. It's certainly you know on my list of of recommendations, uh, uh, and and in, in the answers that are in the in the consulting that I provide any client, but I, I don't know. Um, here's one from Derry. Hey, Derry. Hey, Rich. Uh, sorry. Shirley. Oh, he said, sure. Uh, thanks, Shirley. He references my Shirley joke. Thank you for that there. Haven't we simply forgotten or lost the skills to do the basics right? I mean, the boring, unsexy, and to some extent, time-consuming stuff like standard and privileged account, least privileged passwords, authentication, verification, more generally patching. I think oftentimes we, we think the shiny box will provide protection, and this problem is increased by keeping pace with peers. That said, some do proper mitigation, Derry. Yes, Derry, we have forgotten the basics. We absolutely, this is the process Trump's product. This is, you know, why don't we get that? It's not the firewall, it's the configuration of the firewall. It's not the firewall, it's the maintenance, the monitoring, the patching of the firewall or any other piece of kit or device. Uh, it, you know, we, we don't see it in, we, we, we wanna, you know, it's, it's box checking. This is the thing that's just been ringing in my ears for the last 30 years. Um, any examples of situations, who? Oh, John asked me, any examples of situations where security was done right? John, if you met me, I gotta tell you, uh, the answer will maybe shock you. You know, uh, we, we do pen testing here at the company I work for. And uh, I rarely find, you know, you, that's the thing with pen testing. It's, you know, you, you find a, the, the game is you just find one, one little pennant, you, know, you, you pull the string, you unravel the whole sweater, all right? So you could do pen testing, you see the same thing. Doesn't matter what industry, industry after industry after industry. And people often ask me, what is the most secure industry out there? And for me, it's always, you know, follow the money. That would be your thought. Uh, but, you know, the high street banks and people that I work with, I'm, I'm, sometimes you're just shocked at, uh, at the level, but they're more risk mature. So they understand uh, you, we don't have to fix everything. Anyway, an example of somebody who gets it right with zero tolerance with an approach to risk management and cyber that I've never seen before is, ready for this? The porn industry. The porn industry. I've done security penetration testing for, for this industry and they have stood, stood head and shoulders above any other industry, second to gaming, I would say. But I, I, I actually have a presentation on this because 10 years ago, we started working in this industry, uh, doing pen tests and things like, and I was shocked, shocked. We wouldn't find anything. And we'd do it again and do it again. And, and uh, we'd bring the results in. I'd say, I've been working on this pen test for three weeks. It was a three-day gig. Uh, and I haven't found anything, not even a, a recommendation. Uh, you know, a, 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 how is that? And this guy said, well, if you would have fired, so if you would have found something, somebody would have got fired. Because as Derry, uh, you know, uh, polls uh, said, we forget the basics. Well, this is an industry that does the basics. That's that has the same day patch management. Who does that? It, uh, that that has absolutely everything's fixed and remediated. They leave no string unturned. And when you think about it, what do you? Not to get off on a tangent here, but this is an industry. What's the what's the worst? What's your worst fear? If you give this industry your credit card. Your worst fear is that somebody finds out about it, huh? Your mother, your father, your sister, your husband, your wife, uh, you know, your kids, they take privacy very seriously. And they have zero tolerance for security vulnerabilities in this industry. I've never seen anything like it. It was shocking to me. Why? Because they know what they sell is very private. And I, if you know me, you know I make a joke and say, geez, I wish my bank protected my personal details the way my porn provider did. It's not funny after 10 years of saying it, but anyway, um, yeah, don't get me started on porn, as they say. Richard, we've got two people with their hands up. Shall we uh, turn sorry, to them? Yes, please. How do we... All right, so Sandra, I'm going to allow you to talk now. So you should be able to unmute.
All right, well, we'll move on to David. So David, you should be able to speak now. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we I can, can hear you, David, yeah. I yeah, do. like I say, I mean, around about 20 years back, um, it seemed odd that Microsoft took six months to to issue a service pack to solve a security problem. And I said, thought at the time that maybe this was because not that the solution to the hole was the problem. The problem was to come up with a, a, a back door that would satisfy the relevant US government agencies. And, and that those agencies, in fact, had been demanding a back door in operating systems. And, and this is part of the root of the problem. David, can I get your last name and your home address? You know, I'm an American, right? David. David. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> David, I'm, David, absolutely. Do you ever, say, you ever wonder why the, the EU, remember the, the whole thing the EU had against the Microsoft? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's, that's the, this, the, what do they call it? The nine eyes program, all the top vendors and, you know, from, yes, from Facebook and, and Microsoft and the back doors in Microsoft, the, the, the data sharing with Facebook, uh, uh, it is certainly part of the problem. I, you know, and that's a, that's a, that's a, when you've got a, somebody as big as Microsoft, you know, allowing access to a nation state, whatever nation you belong to, uh, there is no uh, cybersecurity is an oxymoron. This is this is where I've this is how I've handled it, David. Cybersecurity oxymoron. So it's the risk. It's the risk. So should Microsoft be on your risk uh, uh, risk assessment uh, uh, register? Your risk register? Yeah, it should be absolutely. The three six five absolutely. It, it is just this is why cybersecurity oxymoron. So it's about all right. We're going to have to accept that maybe Microsoft will, you know provides a backdoor to government X. Uh, and now what are the what are the what's the risk to to our data from that? Nation states have certainly changed everything on the threat landscape. Well, the, well, the risk is that there's always a back door. Yeah. And, and when the, there are operating system patches coming back, coming out, you know, virtually every week, uh, there's just too much complexity. The, the only way to cut through the complexity is to demand open source operating systems. And, and the only way to, to ensure that we've got operating systems without uh, without hold i mean that, that no us president is ever going to tell his uh, his uh, government agencies to not continue to demand the back door um the eu is probably our only hope um for trying to make some progress there that and and open source Operating systems. I don't, know, I don't know, David. If you saw, I saw a little change. Did you see when Apple refused to give it the back door to the FBI years ago? Uh, it was about five years ago well, now. It's, it's been a little old. They said that, well, I, they said, but at the end of the day, that went on for about a year and a half, two years. And to the best of my knowledge, they never did give over the back door to Apple uh, to, to the FBI. It could be disinformation. <laughs> I like the way you think, David. All right, should we move back to the Q&A now? Sure. Thank you, David. Uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a question. What international local bodies can hold vendors, ISPs, and, or, and, uh, or more accountable, liable? That's a great question. Santana asked this question. Uh, what, are the ethical, what's the, what are the ethical security processes for people? Uh, this is a brilliant question. This is a brilliant question. There's not a, there's not a organization. I'll, I'll be, I, again, full disclosure. I'm a, I'm a member of ISACA. Uh, I don't know if you, if you're familiar with this organization, worldwide organization. And my constant beef with somebody who's got that kind of, is that they should be more proactive in pushing things that are for accountability, uh, you know, accountability with vendors, accountability with service providers, uh, you know, ethical, minimum ethical. You see it in things like Crest, uh, you know, in terms of pen testing, where it's a very specific service. Okay, you know, don't do this, don't do well, All right. But, but when it comes to products and product vendors and, you know, security by design and, you know, and somebody holding a vendor accountable, there is nobody. And, and uh, I'd like to think think maybe 
I don't know, about a year ago, I heard that there was talk about ISO uh, issuing standards for code uh, uh, for any uh, any product that's minimum. So you can you can say my product is ISO compliant, therefore it's met OWASP coding and secure development uh, SDLC live you know uh, um, requirements. But at the end of the day, Santana, I'm sorry, I, I'm not aware of any local bodies. Certainly for ISPs. And, and as David just pointed out, you know, the product with ISPs and managed service providers and security vendors are, they're working with nation states, uh, sharing data, um, both, you know, uh, willingly and unwillingly. But at the end of the day, there's nobody holding anybody's feet to the fire other than Santana. My point was, don't underestimate your power as a consumer. I, I gave you that example of you know, when I was a kid growing up, we didn't have seatbelts in cars. And in the United States, there was one guy who changed that. Um, just just one guy who just would not, his name was Ralph Nader. And I don't know if, if there's any Americans out there, but Ralph Nader was a freaking hero to my generation because he had just constantly stood up against uh, against Detroit who wouldn't spend a dollar to put a canvas seat belt in a you know in a front seat of a car uh, because it was safety we weren't about safety they were about cars and and tirelessly Ralph Nader has you know advocated consumer rights and 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 just just log and suddenly there was legislation it starts on the consumer level if we stop buying it they'll respond quicker so, and local bodies always seem to come later. But for me, the most powerful thing we can do is start acting as, as, as smart buyers of these products and, and saying, this is not good enough. Zero day vulnerabilities in your product and you're a security vendor, unacceptable, unacceptable. Um, but no, sorry, Santana, I am not aware of any, uh, any international or local bodies who, who are in a position to, to, to chastise. Um, I'm sorry, there's, boy, a lot of questions, okay. Uh, in the spirit of solving any problem in software with another layer of indirection, why are we not running any browser application in a lockdown VM mode? <laughs> Raymond asked me this question. Raymond, I don't know. Uh, I could probably, I think that deserves a full standalone uh, presentation. Um, I don't know. This was not, uh, you know, we get into virtual virtual platforms. It's 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 a it's almost a completely different language in the industry uh, that we're not we're not prepared for. Um, sorry, so uh, I get a question from somebody with just numbers. Says, sorry, to, uh, ask me what industry I was referring to. I'm not sure I understand what. Here's another one from from uh, uh, Stuart. Passwords are an epic fail. Yes, Stuart. Yes, they are. When have you ever seen a website that recommends you use a password manager to generate your password? We continue with the pretense that our customer can create a complex password and remember it. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I thought one of the re most refreshing things we've seen is, you know, the guy who brought us that. Uh, you know, it's got to be. Uh, well, alphanumeric uh, uh, contain a code uh, or contain a, 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 what am I trying to say? A, a, a symbol, et cetera. You know, it's gotta be minimum nine lengths. You know, at a, at a black hat conference about three or four years ago, the guy who came up with that, oh, what's his name? You think uh, I should know this guy's name. Anyway, finally said, we, we make passwords that are easy for computers to break and hard for people to remember. And he was advocating passphrases. And, uh, and my gosh, they're, you know, Passphrases, incredibly easy uh, to remember uh, when you put together a good one, three or four words come over 24 characters and incredibly, but no, we don't. And we let, we have let our vendors tell us, you know, about, you know, oh, it can only, can exceed 10 characters, uh, alphanumeric. And suddenly they put, they put us in a box where suddenly we have to have a password manager because, you know, to, to meet best practices and keep 10 different passwords straight, we're going to have to go out and buy a piece of software to act as a manager because our brain's not that good. So this is another thing where this is another area in my mind where we, we I see the tail wagging the dog where vendors are saying you can't because I try to I put past phrases in into websites and they won't accept them too long too too comp you know it is it's way too long no it's got to be nine characters it's got to be uh, you know have a digit in it's got to have uh, uh, upper lower case and and I don't know why but we don't we don't get it we over overly complicate and we just don't learn quick enough. But honestly, some of the most effective, one of the most biggest breakthroughs I've seen in passwords uh, have been passphrases. Rich, hi, this is Darlene here. Just to explain, the guys with the strange numbers 
A-I-E-A, are from Italy. They're part oh. of the Italian fan base from Isaac and Milan chapter. Okay? And there are about 20 of them. Ah, okay. Sorry, guys. And those are the, these and your questions I couldn't answer, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on a second. Uh, so, so sorry, guys. You you had asked me what industry was I referring to? I'm referring to our industry, the cybersecurity industry, or my industry, if you're not in that industry. But what I consider the cybersecurity industry, the vendors, uh, the service providers, the ISPs, anybody you know who's technically responsible for protecting data over the last thirty years. Here's one from Richard, and I love a guy named Richard. Is our problem one of a paradigm? We all use piped water, but the infrastructure is old and leaks. None of us refuse the water because leaks happen. Our water providers attempt to remove leaks to a manageable level and improves targets every year. It seems that organizations and populations have already accepted the inevitability of leaks. Do you hate, or do you agree or hate this parallel? Richard, I love that parallel. I like it because inside that 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 parallel is loss is inevitable. We will always lose water, and as I and I made the you know the the cybersecurity is an oxymoron. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a secure computer. Period. Live with that. Now, what? So, how much risk is acceptable? How much water is acceptable? But, but I know, Richard, when I turn on my pipe and it drips out, and I get my water bill at the end of the month, and it's a couple hundred pounds, I'm thinking, yeah, I, my water company's letting me down. So, yes, absolutely, you're you're, you're right. We're going to lose water in the pipes along the way, and the pipes are old. But again. Richard, to use your analogy, these pipes are only 30 years. And in the, in the, in the scheme of things, in the scheme of business, we are a very young industry. And, we, and my point to all of us is we should have come farther than this in 30 years. We, have, we, we, get, we're, we don't have leaks. We have geysers. You know, the numbers I used, Richard, to say, you know, when Facebook lose, loses 1.5 million and says that's no big deal, it was already gone. This is not a leak. This is not a drip drip. All right, this is, this, this is a lake of de data that we're losing. 14 billion records in less than seven years. You know, so I absolutely agree with your, with your parallel. I, I love it, I, I think it's great. And we've got, you know, rusty pipes where our pipes are old. Don't, you know, I'm, I'm gonna start using that, Richard. I'm gonna steal that from you. Um, Richard, Richard yep. Dallin again. Somebody's come through on the chat. Craig has said, I don't like that, that analogy. I currently have a mains water leak. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're clear, Craig. Here's one from Anthony. There are clearly plenty of problems, but where are you seeing leadership in our industry? Anthony, I don't. Yeah, and that's what, I'm, that's what I'm banging on about tonight. And that's why I made a point with each and every area that I said, where's the leadership? Where is the leadership? I don't know. Where's our Ralph Nader? Where's somebody who's standing up saying, you know, stop, stop. I, I want more than this. I demand more. I don't. I don't know. I don't. Um, I, I, I started to tell you earlier. I'm. I'm active in a membership called ISACA, and I'm constantly. You know, I, I. I'm constantly pushing this and saying, why aren't we writing letters saying, you know, to government saying this is enough? Why aren't we writing letters to ISP saying we we represent a global membership of cybersecurity professionals that say you need to do more? I. I, I don't know, Anthony. I. I. There are problems, uh, but. But I guess in my, my presentation tonight was, we're looking, if we think that vendors are gonna be leaders, we're wrong. If we think managed service providers are leaders, we're wrong, all right? It, 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 we are all, our, our big white, our great white hope is that businesses will finally get it and take the lead and find, you know, turn the key and make the magic happen. And we start protecting data because it's in the business's best interest. And the ISPs and the vendors and everybody will come along. But I, I don't know, for me, this, this has gotta be a consumer, revolution uh, led leadership that starts from the ground up. And, and you know, anybody who's listening, if you're in this industry, I, 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 this, is a, this, this is what I'm trying to get across. Why aren't we asking for more? No, no, why aren't we demanding more? Because I think that's when we'll start to see leaders pop up. I don't know, you lose seven, you know, you lose 14 billion records in seven years, uh, you know, what's left to lead? There's a case to be made. Said, so what's left to be, what's left to, to protect? Has it hasn't? I, I can actually see a, a logic that maybe all the data's already been lost. That you and I and so many people in our industry are are getting paid to protect. It's gone. 
cows out of the barn, as the Americans say. That ship has sailed. That data is lost. It's on the dark web. Go down there and buy it. Uh, here's one from Warren. With all these holes and issues in the industry, how does the role of pen testing fit in, and how much should we trust it? Um, I don't know, Warren. Is that that's kind of a trick question for me? I sell pen testing, and I hate it. I hate it. You know, it's you know, I I I I don't people I don't think people understand it. Uh, I don't think people prepare for it. I don't think people get maximize the return from it. Uh, I have vendors, you know, I have clients who we pen test a year later, we pen test them again, and we find the exact same vulnerabilities. They never fixed it from last year. Um, it's uh, how does the role of pen testing fit into risk management? I think it should. It's certainly one of the tools in your portfolio, but it largely depends on your ability to remediate. I've told clients before, why do you keep pen testing when you're not fixing anything? Why don't you spend the money you, you pay me for this pen test and actually get some remediation done, uh, fix the holes. But pen testing can be a political tool. Uh, we just had a pen test last year or last week or last Tuesday. Uh, and so, you know, so it, it, it's, it's in the wrong hands, it's misunderstood. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a it's a loaded gun for me. Pen testing is is one of the best things and one of the worst things out there. It depends what side of the barrel you're on, I guess. Um, okay, um, Marine. Uh, let's see. We yeah, we covered that. Amber's got, our, Amber says, are we not caught in a fight between vendor that works for the best and the vendors that auditors, clients, and even the courts recognize and appreciate as good? Not using top brands can affect being taken seriously in terms of security standing, regardless of successful protection. Amber, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Yes, we are caught in a fight. I got vendors who go out and buy RSA. Why? Not because it works, be because that's what their board wants to see. And I say, well, good luck with that, because there's open source in, encryption stuff out here that's that's ten times as good as that known product. Okay, that's the, you know this, we see this in in a world people go out and you know they 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 want to get a an audit by you know PwC, not by you know not by only because there's a brand recognition. So yes, I think that's part of the problem. Amber is that these lead, this is why I'm so hard on these leaders because they have the brand recognition. People think, well, if you're using, not using Semantic or Kaspersky or McAfee or whatever it is, then you don't have good anti antivirus. And, and that's absolutely wrong. But that's because they have such brand power in the marketplace that, that not using them requires a, a, an explanation. So not using top brands can be, you know, actually, I, I've seen some people, honestly, uh, and, and I think as an industry professional, I have a responsibility to rec recommend open source. Somebody brought up open source before. The code's transparent. You can see right through it. It's not a Microsoft where you're wondering if there's a back door. It's not an RSA that you're wondering who else has the code uh, of this asymmetric key. So I, I, I absolutely think brand, the power of the brand is part of the problem. And it's also why we should be so hard on it. RSA lost their code. Every single product that uses, you need that, that decryption code. Every single product that 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 uh, that worked with that decryption code was compromised, and yet, you know, I, as I said, RSA, hey, go out and buy RSA stock; it gets better and better every year. I don't know, Amber. I, I it's absolutely part of this, and had I spent more time, I probably would have brought brand into this presentation because it is it is absolutely part of the problem, and not everybody can afford RSA or the top brand in that field. Um, Maureen says, why are we using Zoom? Good, good point, Maureen, because I got nothing to lose is the answer there. Zoom, uh, uh, Maureen, Maureen uh, is a good poke at me. Uh, she also says, shouldn't we be making a fuss about the use of 5G that some vendors are already offering? We should be making a fuss about a lot of things. Um, yes, absolutely, uh, Maureen. It's uh, what we're here to do is start making a fuss uh, as far as I'm concerned. This is part of what should be in our remit. Um, where are we? I think I'm just uh, taking a sampling. I think we pretty much... Here's a comment, I think, as opposed to open source to prevent backdoors, banks used to write their own proprietary operating systems and applications from the ground up. 
And this uh, NSA may still do. Yes, by the way, they do. Maybe that approach needs to come back for those who can't afford it or can't afford not to. Is depending on a few security vendors the problem here or uh, here as they don't fear competition, regulation, or alternatives? This was an anonymous comment, and I think it's a darn good one. I think we need to embrace open source and open competition. And yes, building your own. Uh, you just, you know, certainly Linux has not failed us in all these years because you can, you know, anything where you can pick it up, hold it to the light and understand what's in it. Why aren't we using that? And then taking it and, and you know, uh, yeah, I, I build it your own. I think, the, you know, you kind of answered it in there. A lot of small companies don't have the resources to build it their own. And by the way, I see this trend coming back to the larger enterprises who are absolutely starting saying, screw that, we'll take it and we'll build it, uh, build it from scratch. Um, poof, um, here's one from Richard. What would you say is the mission of a cybersecurity team within an organization? Well, yeah, yeah, patch Zoom, Maureen. <laughs> that comes from Richard, that's not my joke, that's his. Yeah, get our Zoom patches in there. Uh, for me, the role of a cybersecurity team is, is I, you know, it's like, um, you know, those pointer dogs you take hunting. The job is done when the dog points and says, there, there, there. A cybersecurity team should just shine a light and, and uh, bring the risk to the business and the risk says, acceptable, not acceptable. Um, a cybersecurity team should, um, the job is to uh, identify anything that's outside the risk appetite of the business and look only there for the next thing that the business should be concerned about. And, and they're the persons, they're the, the, the team that should be counted on to ring the bells and say, yeah, iceberg up ahead, iceberg up ahead, uh, you know, and allow and get that message up to the, to the, um, the bridge. I, I chased my own analogy there uh, for a decision. Uh, okay. Uh, in your experience, this is from Philip. In your experience, have any national governments made any real progress in leadership here? <laughs> well, uh, Philip, other than China, he says. Okay. Yeah, Philip, I, I think. For me, my preoccupation is with nation states as a threat actor. You know, for me, China is on the front because they have, you know, they, they can take nation state resources and apply them to, to you know, in the cybersecurity landscape, but to their end, to not, not, you know, and certainly from a defense, it's great when you own your own internet. There's a good example of how secure an internet can be when the government owns it, you know. But if we're talking about, you know, nation states in terms of cybersecurity leadership, uh, uh, there was, you know, China for me is not a leader. They're, a, they're, a, they're such a, a, a heavyweight threat actor that I don't see that as, a, certainly in that respect, they're a leader, but, you know, don't underestimate in terms of, of, of proactive capability with the Americans or the French or the English or anybody else who's actively using nation state resources, you know, for, for espionage or, 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 you know, for, for prepare for cyber warfare. Um, yeah, China's a, China's absolutely becoming a standout, uh, um, competitor. For, I, I think everybody's measuring their nation state capabilities against China. Uh, but also China, for me, this is an American working in, in the UK and in Europe. I've seen, you know, China's already taken. Now China's, you know, now China's protecting. I, I, um, I don't, I can't use China and, and cybersecurity leadership in the same, in the same breath. They certainly, any, any of the issues that we talk about, they're on it. They're on the back doors of Microsoft. They're, they're, they're well aware of, you know, the, 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 you know, Facebook platform. They're well aware of how to co-opt this for their own means. But is that leadership? I, I, I'm talk, the leadership I'm talking about is, is, to, is positive leadership that affects change in the industry, that we get better products that actually work. You know, and we have accountability and liability. And and what I brought out about China is how they're quietly buying security companies. You saw that, right? I don't know if you paid, but to, to me, that's that's you know, that's not leadership. <laughs> that's that's an adversary. 
who, who's buying our weapons, you know? Uh, honestly, one of the first questions you should have when you go back to your organization is who owns our VPN that we count on to give us encrypted communications between here and, and, and France or, or between here in the States or, or between Hong Kong and, and, uh, and Egypt, uh, you know? And if, you, if, it's, if it's China made, you, you're, you're not alone on that call. It's uh, like we're not alone on this Zoom call. Um, hi, Marina. Uh, here's one from uh, 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 Marina in Italy. Thank you, Marina. If I feel like a, tele, uh, a radio DJ, thanks for listening. Thanks for calling in. Uh, thanks for your interesting speech. You're welcome. When you say a businessman's only interested in return on investment, do you want to suggest that people in higher positions should have also have the necessary competence uh, to choose the right way and best products and people. Well, no, uh, business is in business is in business. A business is businesses to make money, Marina. So my point was business only understands return on investment. All right, so here's the cybersecurity spend. I'm gonna give you X number to spend this year. I wanna see what that's gonna bring to business. All right, how are you gonna reduce the, 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 uh, our cyber risks? All right, and my complaint was we're not doing that right. We're not articulating the ROI to the business for a decision. Now that decision in terms of what products are most effective doesn't lie with the board. That lies with this Richard Cross, the security team. We, you, we should be doing that if we're part of the team. We should be providing value for money, best return on investment. All right, the board's not going to have the competence to figure out what's better in our RSA and our open source product, uh, product uh, and people. That's us up for us. They just want to see a return on their investment in the cyber spend, meaning we're going to we're going to give you X. How are you going to reduce our risk by by what's that factor? What's the Y? Solve for Y. That's our jobs. So no, they're not they're not in a better position to do that. You and I are in the position to do that. And you and I should be, you know, picking or not picking the products that that give that better return to the business. Here's one by PB. PB, why is it okay for these companies to be bought by China? Why haven't US governments intervened and stopped that? Well, that's a good question, PB. I think we saw that in Huawei, didn't we? Uh, and we see the the government. Well, I certainly saw my government, the U.S. government. You know, we start to embargo things. We 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 cut off. We no longer will use Kaspersky for the for you know when we get evidence that it's being used by a an intelligence service. You know what the government what a government does. What my government did did back in the states is they just said if you're a governing ent entity now you can't buy that product. And they and because all government spends has to be approved, they just put. Kaspersky or whatever that product is, is on the no buy list. But that doesn't stop a U.S. business, even located in Washington, D.C., from buying a Kaspersky product. So, you, you know, who's there? There is no such thing as it unless you get into nation state embargo. But and there's technically, you know, now there's the, there is no right now. There is no nothing that prohibits a foreign government from buying a security product now up to. It, it, it all depends. There's a, there's every country has a short list of security products and that gets into, you know, missile uh, products that are comprised to make missiles or certainly nuclear, uh, you know, components and things like this. But right now, security products that, you know, firewalls, VPNs, this is what I'm talking about, you know, uh, anti-malware, uh, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't stop any government, any government can invest and buy up that company. And this is an interesting thing. This Wired Magazine, by the way, I highly, highly recommend, if you're interested in this, look at that Wired Magazine that looked at nation states, particularly China, moving and making a move and buying up both US and European security manufacturers, security product manufacturers. Uh, Hi, this is Darlin. Feel free to wind up in the next two or three minutes, uh, unless you wanna keep on going, <laughs> yeah? But uh, I think we're running our course, but yeah, they, I've got one or two more. Um, uh, Heiko, Heiko's got one here. It says, have you mentioned, there's a lot of focus on security products, but too little on process and people. Thank you. Yes, Heiko, you were paying attention there. I appreciate that. I think there's also too little attention on secure IT architecture. Absolutely. I, I would agree. Uh, defense in depth, you know. Uh, per, uh, all businesses depend on their IT architecture, but it's rarely subject of IT security webinars and talks. I don't know, Heiko. I, I, 
I think it doesn't, I will always certainly mention, I agree with you that it doesn't get the, the, the spotlight it de deserves in terms of, re you know, return on that investment, you know, designing an architecture, you know, the de defense in depth, you know, to have an outer and uh, a perimeter to, de you know, that can detect, to detect an intrusion and then the next perimeter that can respond uh, or delay an intrusion then an inner that you can respond i mean th this kind of thinking yeah absolutely in terms of risk management it is it is an unbelievable return but so is security by design and it's you know 10 years well, 15 20 years down the road i think i just read look at the OWASP list of top 10 application vulnerabilities 85 percent is the same as it was 15 years ago we're just, that's just not a lesson. So, I mean, that, that, that simple thing by, by building, you know, website applications more securely would stop cross-site SQL injections. That little simple thing is, to, we still haven't learned that. Cross-site SQL injection is still on the OASP list of top 10. So I take your point, Heiko, you're absolutely right. Security architecture, poof, huge benefit. Uh, and it's a very simple thing. It's very basic, but it doesn't get a lot of attention. But what a return. No, it's part of this, you know, buy this product. You don't need to, you know, design uh, depth, uh, design security, in-depth security design. Sorry, I'm getting a little, uh, you just need, you know, our IDS. So I, I, I think it's part of the FUD. It's taken off, as a couple of people have brought up, it's taken our attention off the basics. I think I will wrap up there. I've got, there's just one or two, there's there's a couple, there's more than a few that have done that. I think I've answered everybody's questions. Let me do this though. Let me certainly leave you with, um, uh, there, here's my email address, uh, guys. It's richard.hollis at riskcrew.com. Um, if you if, if you got another, you know, uh, if you've got a comment, uh, if you'd like to, if you're looking for a reference, uh, I'm certainly happy to provide the slides or anything else if you can't, if, if, uh, if Dallin, if you're not going to provide them, but, uh, you know, okay. I can be in touch after this without, you know, if you have any other questions, uh, follow up, but, uh, um, uh, yeah, anyway, don't hesitate to, to, to give me a holler, um, or, or ask me for a reference or something I've been talking about. I, Thank you, everybody. I, I appreciate the time, the effort. I know it's after hours and these webinars can get a little long. And uh, anyway, I, thanks, I thank you for your time and your patience and above all, your sense of humor. Hmm. Have a good night. Hey, thank you very much, Rich. I thought that was really brilliant. And there are about 150 people still with us who think likewise. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard Hollis, for super presentation and discussion afterwards that was well worthwhile and again just picking on the italian example we still have about 15 people from milan and around there still with us but i'm going to just read you one comment from another uh, attendee uh, and this is from hans who says thanks for all your efforts I'm a member of ISARCA too. I'm advising the office of the, C of the CISO of the city of Toronto on cyber diplomacy and cyber strategy. So your thoughts and insights are welcome. So well done, spreading, spreading around the world there. <laughs> and as far as this um, great session has been concerned, you certainly spread around a whole load of questions and a whole load of grumpiness your word, not mine, that makes us keep on thinking and keep on questioning what we're doing. Let's keep moving the world on, Richard, and thank you so much. Thanks, Dom. Yep. And all the best to you for being part of this great audience. We look forward to seeing you again, May 13th, if you will, or else May 19th, or onwards in terms of future webinars and so on. Enjoy, keep safe, Keep well and see you next time. Bye for now.